All right, well, thanks for joining me uh, on this uh, latest virtual office hours. Um, I'm definitely doing more of these than I had expected to in the short term, uh, given a lot of other deadlines that are urgent, but I think this is a really effective way uh, to talk with folks, to talk with journalists, uh, and to get it all done and all wrapped up within a single hour. So I, I do think uh, this is this has been really helpful. I know a lot of fo- I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about this, so I know folks uh, appreciate it. So I'm going to keep doing it, uh, and hopefully there'll be occasion in the next few weeks to start doing these a little less frequently. Uh, but right now, of course, there's there's some uh, very active and high impact weather coming once again. So just to summarize what's happened since the last one, and a lot has happened since late last week, we did have our uh, we did have our major warm atmospheric river, Pineapple Express style atmospheric river last Friday. Uh, it uh, largely brought the impacts to California that were expected. Uh, it did not bring major flooding to Northern California. In fact, it was not an especially especially remarkable storm across much of northern california it was a much more significant storm across portions of central california so from about uh, the big sur coast inland across parts of the southern san joaquin valley and into the southern sierra foothills and the southern sierra foothills i think were uh, very hard hit initially with with some significant snow melt because there's a lot of territory on rivers like the kern and tule uh, below about 4,500 feet, which is up to that elevation where there was significant snowmelt from this event, and so those fast responding rivers caused some significant flooding uh, in the communities uh, within watersheds that drain these southern Sierra Nevada rivers. Uh, also, significant flooding ha- has occurred in far northern Monterey and far southern Santa Cruz counties along the Pajaro River, uh, including the, t- the town of Pajaro itself, which is uh, essentially inundated uh, due to a levee break on that river. Um, The flooding there has receded a bit but may get worse again with the incoming storm and there could be other problems elsewhere in the Salinas Valley and generally in the Santa Cruz Mountains and Monterey County uh, during this upcoming event. Uh, The challenge of course is that not any one storm affects the whole state in the same way and california is a big state and and this this friday storm brought some significant impacts to portions of central california but not really to northern california or really far southern california either so this was definitely a central california storm um interestingly the impacts of the flooding from this event uh which i I will just emphasize did not despite some online rumors uh, melt all the snowpack in fact did not even melt uh, most of the snowpack. Uh, in fact, quantitatively, it actually uh, resulted in a heavier snowpack, a larger snowpack today than before the warm storm. It doesn't mean there wasn't snow melt at lower elevations. There was, of course. But what it means is that there was actually still snow at the highest elevations, and interestingly, even in places where rain did fall on snow at, say, five or six, even 7,000 feet, uh, that snowpack, which is very deep and cold, mostly absorbed the water. So it actually absorbed more water uh, than it than it melted, essentially. So now uh, the snow water equivalent in the southern and central Sierra is significantly higher than before the warm storm. And in fact, as is mentioned on some of my recent Twitter threads, uh, is now the highest on record, as far as I can tell. Uh, going back to the beginning of the period of record. So right now there is more snow water in the southern and possibly central Sierra than there has ever been uh, at this time of year and possibly at any point uh, during the year, especially in the southern Sierra. So there is a whole hell of a lot of water up there right now uh, stored in the snowpack. And that's not likely to melt in this incoming storm either, even though it's also another relatively warm one, although it won't be as warm as the last. Um, Again, I think this storm will cause yet another net increase in SWE, or that snow water equivalent in the mountains. So there'll be even more snow water up there uh, beyond the current record level uh, by the middle of this week. I'll talk about that a little bit later in the context of why, although I'm not particularly concerned about snowmelt flooding this week, uh, uh, it is a growing concern for later this season. So we're talking late March into April, especially, and possibly into May. If we do get another series of of late warmer storms and or even if the skies are clear, but we get a prolonged early season heat wave, 
we could see significant snowmelt flooding, uh, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley and on some of the Sierra East Slope watersheds that drain into the Great Basin and into Nevada. Uh, that is going to be a considerable concern uh, later this spring, although I will again mention not right now so much. There just really isn't any mechanism to melt a lot of that high elevation snowpack yet. But eventually it's going to happen, and the question is whether it happens uh, quickly versus slowly. Is it gradual snowmelt, in which case the flood, uh, flood concerns will be mostly minor? Uh, or is it more rapid? And, and you know, more rapid could mean anything from a conditional risk of, of flooding, minor to moderate flooding, to uh, rapid snowmelt, in which case we could be talking about something uh, in, the, in, in the major flood territory. It's really just too early to speculate which of those is going to happen, but I would expect to see at least minor flooding later this spring as a direct result of higher elevation snowmelt, probably late March or April, but maybe into May. Um, all right, so that's the medium term, but let me, let me uh, jump back in time to the, the, the upcoming storm, the one that's going to hit uh, later tonight into tomorrow across most of California. This one is taking shape now uh, over the Pacific Ocean between the Hawaiian Islands and California. In fact, you can actually see it quite clearly on satellite that the moisture plume extends almost all the way from California to the south and west of the Hawaiian Islands. So this is a, a yet another warm Pineapple Express type atmospheric river. This one won't be quite as warm as the last because there is more cold air uh, wrapped into the, the storm itself on the back end, but at least initially there will be some quite warm rains. Interestingly, this warm and unstable plume has been draped across Northern California now for, uh, and Central California for a couple of days. So uh, after, in the wake of the last warm atmospheric river, there was really no cold front to speak of, to come in and sweet, sweet scour out that warm, moist air. And in that, in that warm sector uh, that Northern California has been in, there have been some pretty unusual weather over the weekend. Even though there were no large scale storm systems, there, were, there was quite a bit of convective activity and thunderstorms, especially across the interior. So the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley in particular. And in fact, there were severe thunderstorms on both Saturday and Sunday uh, in the southern half of the Central Valley uh, that produced at least one confirmed tornado and a whole lot of fairly large hail and flash flooding uh, into the lower foothills. That's pretty unusual. These storms were not your classic California mini supercell, low top supercell uh, in the cold sector uh, of a cutoff low pressure system or something, but instead, uh, these were these were sort of warm sector, moist and unstable air mass type supercells that you might see more on the high plains of Colorado and Nebraska. This was pretty unusual for Central California to see supercell thunderstorms that had this uh, pretty spectacular organizational structure and caused, caused some pretty significant problems locally. They were, of course, localized, but if you were under the core of one of these, you may have seen uh, very strong gusty winds, um, large amounts of accumulating hail, an, an inch or two of hail accumulating on the ground, and probably most consequentially was the localized flash flooding that occurred. Some places saw a couple inches of rain over the course of just 30 to 60 minutes. That's a whole lot of water, especially if you're in the Central Valley or, or in the Sierra foothills that are already quite saturated. So this wasn't even really part of a big storm but it was in this unstable air mass in between storms, and even that air mass has been producing some uh, significant, hydrologically significant precipitation, keeping those watersheds primed and resulting in some unusually spectacular storm chasing opportunities for the folks who went out there uh, in the Central Valley uh, this weekend. So there's been some exciting weather even then at, in between storms. Now, with this one that's coming in, that, that warm and moist air mass is going to be reinforced further and although, again, this is not looking like it's going to be an extreme atmospheric river, this is probably going to be somewhere between moderate and strong territory on a scale from a weak to extreme. So it's sort of right near the middle, upper middle of the scale, but not on the high end necessarily. But the problem is there are two reasons why I think this moderate to strong atmospheric river is going to cause bigger problems uh, than the perhaps similar uh, moderate to strong atmospheric river we saw uh, late last week. Uh, and this is why I'm more concerned about this one uh, than the previous one, because, of course, as I always say, context matters. Uh, 
And in this case, the context is that the antecedent conditions are now extremely wet. So the soils are not just saturated, but are, in a lot of cases they're super saturated. People are sending me images of water uh, sort of shooting out of the ground, uh, artesian wells and, and hillsides that are just, uh, these underground springs are just popping up and flowing out of. So that's definitely uh, a sign of super saturation. The soil column is completely saturated and there's even water running out of the soil in some places downhill. Uh, rivers, of course, are running high. Some are still at flood stage, particularly in Monterey County. Others are close to flood stage, near monitor stage. And so that's the setting uh, for, for this upcoming event. So even though precipitation totals during this upcoming storm will be far from historic, uh, the impacts will be probably greater than the precipitation totals would otherwise suggest for, for these two reasons. The, one of, the first of which was what I just mentioned. These antecedent conditions are extremely wet and it's going to be, the, the watersheds are prime, so it's not going to take a whole lot of precipitation to result in immediate runoff and rises on rivers and streams uh, and flooding of urban areas. So, the, so these antecedent conditions are super wet. Uh, this is another fairly warm storm, so there's going to be additional rain uh, into the foothills, probably not a huge amount of snowmelt contribution from this one, but even just the rain falling in the foothills rather than falling as snow increases the amount of runoff you get, even if you're not getting snowmelt. So that does still matter. Uh, the other chat, the other reason why I think this storm may be higher impact than the atmospheric river scale would suggest is that this one is going to be associated with a much stronger surface low pressure system just off the coast of Northern California. And there's still a bit of disagreement. And I guess when I say a bit, there's a fair bit of disagreement between the models even the day before the storm makes landfall. The European model, the ECMWF, is suggesting a significantly stronger surface low closer to the Northern California coast. That would potentially result in a major windstorm in Northern California in addition to the heavy rainfall, that it would probably be heavier rainfall if the European model solution comes to fruition. If the American model is right, the low pressure system won't be quite as deep. It'll be a little bit further away from the coast, and the atmospheric river will be a little bit wider but more diffuse. So. Uh, less peaky, maybe a wider region of moderate to heavy rain, but less heavy rain at its peak, and and probably less strong winds as well. I would tend to lean towards the European model, the more uh, aggressive scenario in this case, for a variety of reasons. It's a bit higher resolution. Um, there are some reasons to think that it may be ingesting some of the uh, augmented observational data that's coming from the Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Uh, missions that the that Scripps and NOAA are currently flying into the uh, northeastern Pacific Ocean to, to gather data on these events before they make landfall and improve predictions. So uh, it really could go either way. It could be more the European model route or the American model route, but I would, if I had to make a guess, I'm going to guess the European model route, in which case Northern California would probably be harder hit, perhaps more so than some of the forecasts currently uh, indicate because this would mean not only stronger winds with a stronger surface pressure gradient closer to the coast, but also probably more intense precipitation because there'd be more strong upward vertical motion posed by the dynamics of the low pressure system itself. So less dependent on or orography on the mountains for that lift and the formation of precipitation and a more equal opportunity precipitation event across Northern California. So Again, I still don't expect the precipitation totals themselves to be uh, all that remarkable, but the problem is getting a few inches of rain, especially if it falls quickly, if those hourly rates are high, and that certainly appears possible because in this storm, there could be thunderstorm downpours, narrow cold frontal rain bands. Um, whatever precipitation does fall from this event will likely fall, much of it, uh, pretty quickly over the course of just a few hours rather than being long, gradual, and drawn out. So I do think that's gonna cause some significant flood problems, especially flash flood problems on faster responding rivers and streams. Still doesn't look like we're going to see major main stem river flooding. So I'm talking about like the Sacramento River, the San Joaquin River in this case. There could be a few forecast points that just make it above monitor stage into marginal flood stage, but on these major rivers with levee systems and flood control systems, that won't actually really do any major harm or inundation. Uh, but where I do think that there's more significant flood risk is in the smaller rivers and streams in the Bay Area and into the North Bay, so Mendocino, Lake County, southward into uh, Monterey County and probably a bit south of that uh, into uh, SLO and, and Santa Barbara, probably um, at the far southern end, probably not too much farther south than that, 
Although it will rain in Southern California, the flood risk will be lower because it hasn't been as wet uh, south of, of Santa Barbara recently. Uh, so there's significant flood risk, again, along the central coast, uh, Big Sur, Santa Cruz Mountains. Flood risk with this one will be higher in the San Francisco Bay Area North Bay than during the last event, and probably higher uh, in the northern Sierra foothills. It's a little bit difficult to say whether the flood risk will be higher in the southern Sierra foothills this time versus the last time, but there definitely is flood risk. Uh, rivers, again, already running high. Uh, lake levels, reservoir levels are now at flood pool, so there's going to have to be releases for flood pool that will add to the runoff downstream. So there could be significant flooding on some of the smaller rivers and streams, again, in the southern Sierra uh, watersheds that drain into the San Joaquin Valley, so on the San Joaquin Valley east side also. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say because it really depends on whether the European model or the American model are more accurate. Again, that European model really slams northern California quite hard with uh, high winds and heavy rain that would result in widespread power outages and probably widespread uh, flash flooding of, of uh, faster responding watersheds. Uh, the, the American model suggests less of a wind event up north, less of a flood risk up north, but probably a greater flood risk along the central coast in the southern Sierra. So uh, I think unfortunately we have to think about be prepared for both outcomes. Don't know which one is more likely even though I'm slightly leaning towards the European model. So what that means is that the rainfall rates, the intensity will be higher with this event than the last event. The winds will likely be higher with this event than the last event. The total precipitation may not be any higher with this event than the last event, but I actually expect the flood risk will probably be at least somewhat higher, if not significantly higher in many places during this event, given that the intensity uh, of the rainfall, the per hour rates will probably be higher. So for faster responding watersheds, that'll be a big problem and the antecedent conditions are just that much more saturated. We just got all this rain, rivers are already running high, there's still some residual snow melt. All of those things point toward elevated flood risks with this event compared to the last. Still don't see uh, a likelihood of a, a catastrophic flood event. I still see that language floating around, but that doesn't mean that there can't be localized flooding that's highly consequential or even quite severe. Um, really any flooding is potentially life-threatening, it's worth emphasizing, because folks unfortunately die every year when they drive their cars into flooded underpasses, so it really doesn't take a major flood to potentially be dangerous. Um, you know, it, any amount of water that's more than a few inches deep is potentially dangerous if uh, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time or if you aren't, you know, exercising reasonable caution. So. It's not to say that flooding isn't dangerous, it's just to put things a little bit into perspective. Although I do actually think that the flood risk with this event is probably higher than the last, and it is possible that at least a couple of smaller river systems could end up hitting major flood stage from this. Again, probably not the large rivers and probably not very many rivers, but it is possible on, 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 on a couple of smaller rivers, especially in central California uh, or up into the southern part of the Bay Area, depending on where this uh, atmospheric river axis maximally sets up. All right. Um, oh, and one final thing I wanted to mention before I start answering some questions from this. Uh, the good news is that after this event this week, um, uh, the Monday through Tuesday storm, once that departs, I do think that there will be a calmer pattern. Not a, necessarily a dry pattern, but a much less wet and active pattern where the likelihood of uh, strong atmospheric rivers really decreases, where the storms uh, will probably be more spaced out and significantly weaker, uh, as you might expect as we head into the latter half of March. So I think if we can get through this event this week, uh, I think there will be, uh, if not a complete break, at least a window during which the, the river levels will still recede. Soils may stay saturated, but the river levels will go down. People will be able to more effectively dig out from these enormous snow loads that have caused so many problems, structure collapses, transportation nightmares, just general accessibility problems almost everywhere in the mountains in California. Um, and so that's good news, I think, is this is the last of the big ones in this week sequence, as far as I can tell right now, even though things do look relatively unsettled for the foreseeable future. Um, the big challenge, as I mentioned, then is going to be, I think, starting a few weeks from now and going for, um, for a couple months after that, is that we're going to have to be watching this enormous and maybe record-breaking Southern Sierra snowpack really closely. 
uh, for uh, for potential for rapid melt, either due to a renewed sequence of warm storms later this year as the sun angle gets higher as temperatures go up, or likewise a major sudden heat wave that could have a similar effect. So right now, don't see uh, high potential for short-term melt uh, from either of these things, despite the big storm coming in this week. The flood risk this week is almost all coming from heavy rainfall and very saturated soil conditions rather than a major amount of snow melt. But later this season, we may well have to contend with a different kind of flooding that is primarily snow melt driven. So I'm sure we'll be talking more about that later. It's not an immediate risk, but it is a pretty significant risk in the medium term this year, given the state of the snowpack. All right, so let me start taking some questions here and see um, a question from uh, Fog Machine. Uh, why these uh, tropical-based lightning storms are so infrequent. Um, some irony there, uh, and actually a bit of an explanation in the name, in the username Fog Machine, uh, which is that we are not, we, we're in the, the what's known as the, the stable subtropics. It's why coastal California sees so much fog in the spring and the summer. It's why that fog machine exists. We have a very cold ocean uh, immediately adjacent to the state. And we have, in addition to this, we have we sort of exist at the margin between the subtropical uh, doldrums, uh, as it were, and the more active mid-latitude jet stream uh, to to our north. And this is why California has a really well-defined wet season versus a really well-defined dry season. That jet stream, so the really the dividing line between the uh, the relatively quiescent subtropics and the more active weather in the mid-latitudes is not a static division. It evolves over time. And by over time, I mean uh, from season to season. So that dividing line is farther south in winter than it is in summer. That's why California does see active weather, uh, most winters anyway. Uh, it varies from year to year. So this is one of the main reasons why El Nino and La Nina can affect southwestern hydroclimate because it pushes that average wintertime boundary of the subtropics uh, farther south during El Nino, bringing on average wetter conditions to the southwest. And the reverse is true in La Nina um, with, of course, year to year variations in that pattern. And then there's longer term uh, climate and climate change kinds of variations uh, where the boundary in general between the subtropics and the mid-latitudes is shifting poleward, so northward, almost everywhere on Earth, except, interestingly, for the North Pacific, just west of California, where it does not appear to be doing this, which is one of the reasons why uh, California is not currently projected to get dramatically drier in winter, unlike almost all other so-called Mediterranean climates on Earth. It's not entirely clear why that is the case in these projections, but stay tuned for that one. But the point being, uh, given the, the initial question is why, why, why are our, our warm, moist atmospheres that lead to thunderstorms infrequent, is that you really need two things uh, to see thunderstorms. You need sufficient uh, moisture in the atmosphere, which is actually not what is lacking in California. In fact, even in summer, as you see with the fog, the lower layers of the atmosphere actually are pretty moist a lot of the time. But what you also need on top of that is upward vertical motion and atmospheric instability. And those are usually the two things that are missing in California uh, throughout the year, but especially in the summer months when it's warm and relatively moist along the coast from the Pacific influence. First of all, that moisture along the coast is pretty shallow. You know, the fog is not 10,000 feet tall. It's maybe a couple thousand feet tall if it's really deep or maybe even less if it's shallow. You can usually see the top of it. In fact, if you're at the top of the tall buildings in downtown San Francisco, or you're up on Mount Tam, or, or the crest of the Santa Cruz Mountains or something, you're often above the fog layer because the, that moisture layer is really only a couple thousand feet thick. Um, and the other reason is that you have downward motion in the atmosphere in the subtropics on average. Not every single day, and usually the days uh, when we have upward motion are the exceptions, the, those relatively rare exceptions. But in general, downward motion does not favor uh, the formation of clouds and precipitation. It's why we have a summer dry season. And so we also lack atmospheric instability. So the propensity of air near the surface of the Earth to spontaneously rise and condense and form into cumulus clouds that's fairly unusual in California. It's very common in other parts of the world. If you go to other places in the world during the warm season, you see those billowy, puffy cumulus clouds 
uh, on an almost daily basis. You go to a place like Florida and almost like clockwork every day by noon, they're turning into showers and thunderstorms. And that is because the atmosphere is not only moister uh, throughout the vertical column, but also because there's more uh, instability in the atmosphere. So there's a, a, a temperature a vertical profile that's more favorable for those air parcels to spontaneously start rising and bubbling up in the atmosphere. We get that every once in a while in California. We actually have seen it this weekend in the Central Valley. That's why we had those supercell thunderstorms. Uh, but it's rare. And it's even rarer to see it attached to a sort of a warm atmospheric river air mass. That was actually something I haven't seen in a long time. So this was pretty unusual this weekend. It's more often we get those thunderstorms usually when we get cold air moving in a loft, which can destabilize the atmosphere without making it really warm at the surface. So this is a bit of an unusual pattern, and I think it's correct to, to say that it's uh, pretty unusual. So maybe a bit of a longer explanation than, than the fog machine was looking for, but it's an interesting question. Another comment that there's a lot of snow still that can be seen from the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, or it actually, sorry, it has melted. Uh, the weather has felt warm and humid on Saturday, almost like Hawaii. Uh, yeah, actually the weather was warm and humid like Hawaii because this air mass is coming directly from Hawaii. So uh, it's only been partially modified by the ocean. Uh, kind of amazing after all this low elevation snow we saw just about a week ago or so. But there you have it. Things changed very, very quickly. Um, the the uh, the good news about that is that the extent to which that snow has already melted, it means that there's not a huge risk of snowmelt flooding in the the San Bernardino Mountains. There's some additional uh, runoff risk since the rainfall from this event will likely be heavier than the last there, but there still isn't a super high risk of snowmelt flooding, again, because some of that snow has now already melted uh, and the rivers are not running that high yet there. So they have a fairly decent capacity to absorb uh, absorb additional rainfall and, and runoff from snowmelt, unlike the river systems right now in Northern California, where that is not the case, where everything is completely saturated. Let's see here. Question from Mary about why don't these pineapple expresses, i.e. these, these subtropical uh, subset of atmospheric rivers, uh, make it up to Portland, Oregon? And the answer is that they actually do. Uh, in fact, uh, they make it all the way up into British Columbia. So anywhere along the Pacific coast is essentially uh, susceptible to these. They just don't occur this time of year up north for the most part. It's more of, a, of an autumn and late autumn thing as you get up into the Pacific Northwest and, and, and Western Canada and the Southeastern Alaska Panhandle because the wet season actually peaks there a couple months earlier than it does in California for the same reason that I just mentioned earlier, which is that that jet stream, that boundary between the subtropics and the mid-latitudes shifts southward uh, in winter. And the focal point for uh, Pacific storm activity is in the autumn uh, up in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest, uh, but then shifts southward into Oregon and then into California as you go into December and January uh, and February and into March. And then it starts to shift back northward again in the spring, where the Pacific Northwest get, gets a bit wetter again before drying out in the summer, uh, and California really starts to dry out in the spring. So it's just sort of part of the seasonal cycle. This isn't really the peak time of year for seeing these pineapple expresses up north. There haven't been very many in the Pacific Northwest uh, this season. They've really all been aimed squarely at California for reasons that are not entirely clear at this point, uh, but uh, I'm sure folks will be looking at this winter uh, in retrospect, because it has really been a doozy in California, and that's for sure. And there's a lot. To t there's a lot to think about. All right. Uh, let's see here. A note uh, that the uh, that the Cahuilla River is also a very fast responding, which makes sense given the the flashiness of that watershed, so to speak. Uh, and, and the terrain that it drains, where there's a fair bit of uh, land between the two and 5,000 foot elevation, uh, where there has been significant snowmelt, unlike the, the regions above 5,000 feet, where there really hasn't been a lot of snowmelt. So the most vulnerable watersheds to snowmelt during these events have been the ones that drain, have a lot of land at sort of low to medium elevations. So the ones that have primarily high elevation uh, drainages have not had that many problems because there, there just hasn't been that much snowmelt from those higher elevations, but there has, given the relatively extensive snowpack between about uh, 1,500 and, and 3,000 feet, which isn't usually so significant. So that makes sense. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> 
Let me just skip to the bottom. So let me scroll carefully here. Any idea what might happen in Yosemite Valley flood-wise? Currently, there's not much of a flood risk to speak of this week, uh, but that could change later on the Merced River. Uh, there, there is more flood risk on the Merced River downstream, actually, this week, where there could be uh, significant flooding uh, on and near the Merced River uh, in the valley later this week. Not necessarily major flooding, which has a particular meaning, but it, the river level, it will be perhaps more than minor flooding. And there are, this is a levied system, and so all of these things are, all of these statements are somewhat contingent on there being no problems with the levees, as we saw uh, along the Pajaro River. That's not a huge river, but it's causing uh, s a serious flooding in, in the t it, it, on the banks because of that levee break, which is of course letting the water out, even with relatively minor flooding on the river itself. Uh, if there's no levee in place, then obviously places are going to get flooded. And so that's always a caveat, especially in the Central Valley where there is a fairly high level of flood protection in many places, but of course that's contingent on the flood protection actually working. There's currently no indication that there are any alarming things going on in the short term on, on, on the Central Valley levees but it always remains as a possibility. So the Merced River, uh, River downstream is going to have some issues this week, probably not extreme problems, but potentially significant problems nonetheless. Upstream, uh, that drainage is so high that it isn't experiencing a whole lot of snowmelt yet, uh, but stay tuned regarding what happens this spring along the Merced River in Yosemite Valley. Uh, there could be bigger problems to come down the line when that higher elevation part of the snowpack starts to melt. Uh, four common questions uh, that Allison is hearing are, uh, how does this affect the drought? How is this related to climate change? How is this affecting Southern California, uh, both in the mountains and the lower elevations? Uh, and then the fourth being, uh, what could all this rain snow mean for spring, especially regarding the drought outlook, uh, flooding, and fire season? So a lot of questions baked in there. I think I've addressed some of those, particularly what it means for spring. I think that there is going to be a conditionally much higher than usual risk of flooding, especially in the Central Valley this spring from snowmelt, depending on how things go. Stay tuned for that. I touched on fire season uh, last time. I think that this year, this will be a year where there isn't much of a fire season at higher elevations, maybe above about six or 7,000 feet. So I don't think this is a year where we're going to see a repeat of something like the Caldor Fire, which burns from the foothills over the crest of the Sierra into the Tahoe Basin. That just does not look like the kind of year where that kind of behavior is likely, so that's good. Um, on the other hand, it's often the wet years that are worse fire years at lower elevations, so because it results in a lot of extra growth of brush and grass, and we've also seen a lot of tree damage from the low elevation snow events. So there's going to be a bunch of new dead and down material from tree branches and trees that fell during these low elevation snowstorms. The real question is the extent to which that all dries out this summer and fall. And at the highest elevations, I don't really think there's going to be time for things to fully dry out by autumn. Honestly, I think the snowpack in some places at high elevations it isn't going to melt till June, July, maybe even August in some spots. And so things will remain damp up there all the way through the end of fire season in the autumn. At lower elevations, though, it really depends what happens. If we have a nice long wet spring and a mild early summer, this could be a pretty mild fire season overall. But if we have early spring heat waves, or if we just have a hot summer in general and a windy fall, then we could very well see a severe fire season at low elevations because of all the extra growth of brush, grass, the new dead and down material, uh, providing more fuel for things that inevitably dry out. I just continually remind folks of what happened in the autumn following the last wettest winter on record in 2016-2017 in parts of Northern California, the autumn 2017 fire season, which followed just uh, after that long hot summer, that record hot summer, in fact, was was catastrophically destructive in Northern California. This was the year of the extreme North Bay fires and some of the fires in the northeastern uh, uh, Sierra foothills. Um, you know, this was the year where or the Tubbs fire uh, burned a significant portion of Santa Rosa. So. Uh, just because we have a really wet winter does not mean that it's obviously a mild fire season everywhere, but it does change the dynamics probably across different ecosystem types. It does mean that the higher elevations are likely out of the game this year, which has not been the case recently, and that the kinds of fires we're, we're more likely to see are those sort of in these mixed vegetation regimes, so the mixed forest, brush, grassland kinds of regimes, rather than these... Uh, really dense forest stands at high elevations. So uh, 
Uh, it's a bit early to say. It kind of depends on what happens this spring. If things dry out quickly uh, and warm up quickly, it might be off to the races. Uh, if we have a mild spring, early summer, then it really might be a quite a mild start to fire season everywhere. But then even then, it's a question of what happens this summer and fall at lower elevations. So that's my current thoughts about fire season. How does it affect the drought? Obviously, it helps dramatically to have this large of a snowpack and to have this much water falling from the sky as rain or snow everywhere. Uh, it really, I think, it's going to get at the, the, the essence of what is drought. Uh, in a warming climate. It's clearly not just a lack of rain, because if it were just a lack of rain, then then the drought would be over. But then again, it would have been over multiple times in the past decade uh, if it was just a matter of a lack of rain. So then the question is more broadly, is it a lack of water? Okay, but in what context? Does it mean that the reservoirs are, are full or not full? Does it mean that groundwater is replenished versus not replenished? Does it mean that the ecological impacts of droughts that have occurred over the past decade uh, are obviated and go away or not? Each of those, I think, have their place as definitions of drought, and everybody uses a different definition of drought. So the strict interpretation of meteorological drought, which is usually, is there a net uh, precipitation deficit over the last 12 to 18 months? Then no, there's not going to be a drought in California after this. But I don't think that tells the whole story, uh, because it doesn't tell us enough about, uh, it doesn't tell us enough about the long-term context of what the effect of droughts have been on ecosystems, what the effect of the uh, human-mediated uh, over-pumping and overdraft of groundwater in the Central Valley um, has been over years, uh, what the broader picture of water looks like in the West, including, for example, the Colorado Basin. Um, so obviously, this makes things a lot better. California is not going to see severe drought impacts this year. Uh, it, it, the, the, the water issues that a lot of folks had worried would get quite acute if uh, the drought continued at its severity from last year are not going to happen this year. So that's the good news. Uh, there will be some ecosystem recovery. The snowpack is especially helpful in that regard. So the widespread forest mortality we've been seeing in recent years will likely be I mean, not reversed, obviously. Uh, trees don't come back from the dead. If, if they've died during these droughts, they're gone. But this will probably attenuate ongoing loss quite significantly, at least for a year or two. These trees are getting a nice, deep soaking, and they're going to get replenishment of that water as the snow melts into the spring and summer, so that's good. Uh, this has been a decent snow year across a lot of the Colorado Basin as well. Not as extremely spectacular as in California, but a good year nonetheless, and a great year locally in some parts of the Colorado Basin. So I do think that this also will probably stave off the worst case scenario predictions for the Colorado Basin this year as well. There, I think it does not go nearly as far towards alleviating the long-term drought. We would need a lot of years like this in a row to do that in the Colorado Basin. So uh, the long-term crisis, water crisis on the Colorado Basin will still exist even after a relatively good snow year. But it, I do think that the, 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 the alarm over Deadpool this year in particular is probably uh, a little bit less now than, than before we had this winter. I think the alleviation of the drought in California specifically will be more than that. So I think, um, I think this year will, look, will feel very different. Uh, should be a good wildflower year uh, and should be, uh, I know folks are, are wondering what's going to happen in the Sierra backcountry this summer for people hiking and stuff. Uh, it's going to be rough because there's, instead of smoke this year, there may actually be too much snow on the ground uh, and, and, the, and the creek and, and river crossings might be dangerously high because everything is going to be melting well through the summer. So different kind of problem, but I think most folks would agree it's a better problem than, than having these huge uh, season-long smoke storms. Uh, so um, those are my current thoughts. In terms of climate change, you know, the interesting part of this is that even in a year that is in some places, this winter has been the coldest winter in some California cities in, in 20, 30, or even 40 years, in none of California cities is it the coldest winter uh, on record. We've seen very, f very few, if any, all-time low temperature records this winter. So it's been definitely a cold winter, especially by recent standards. Uh, it's been, you know, a, a very cold winter in California by the standard of the last 30 years. But of course, that's a moving target. Uh, the standard of the last 30 or 40 years has warmed considerably. Uh, by and and so California on average has warmed about three degrees Fahrenheit since the late 1800s. That's a pretty significant warming. In some places it's been more than that, in other places it's been a bit less than that. But overall, as a statewide basis, on an annual basis, that warming is about three degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 
So imagine if this kind of winter had occurred uh, a century or so ago. It would have been a full three or four degrees colder, probably, than, than what we're seeing right now. Uh, that, you know, that might have resulted in snows at sea level. Uh, we would have seen a, some of these warm storms probably wouldn't have been so warm. They would have been even larger snow accumulation uh, events. So it, I think it's food for thought. Um, on a precipitation side, this is really just playing into this notion that we're likely to see both uh, more pre precipitation and hydroclimate whiplash in California as the climate warms, and then a lot of that is going to be driven Again, I know this is a surprise to a lot of folks, but it's going to be driven primarily by wet the wet side more than the dry side. So we will see drier dries and wetter wets, but it's all of it is still suggests that the wets will become even wetter than the dries will become drier. So we still see a lot of both, and the whiplash increases between them, but it's really the big, huge precipitation events that get wetter at the expense of most of the other precipitation events. And that's what we've been seeing this year. There have been a lot of precipitation records set this winter. Uh, so last winter, we set some all-time dry precipitation records. And now this winter, we're setting some all-time re wet records, including some of the, the, the wettest one-day events that some places in California have seen in over a century have occurred this year now. In other parts of California, they happened last year, and in other parts of California the year before that. Uh, all of this unfolding at the end of historically severe drought. So what does that tell us? Well, I think it gives us yet more anic data, uh, data that has not yet been formally an an analyzed, but, but definitely points in the same direction as what predictions from climate models and from theory have been for a long time about increasingly uh, whiplashy hydroclimate in California driven primarily by increasingly wet extreme events on the wet end of the spectrum uh, as in addition to perhaps more intense droughts as well. So I think that part, uh, I think we, we, you know, we saw the atmospheric river on, on Friday, for example, brought some of the moistest air that California has ever seen in March to the state, for example. Uh, that's one of the most direct impacts of climate change, is raising the ceiling on how much moisture can be in the atmosphere uh, by virtue of that exponential relationship between the water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere and temperature. So, uh, you know, I think that in retrospect, there's probably going to be a lot of things about this winter that we can talk about in a climate change context. The one thing I don't think is true is that we're not seeing colder winters, we're not seeing more low elevation snow events. We are definitely seeing an interesting effect where in the higher mountains, the, we're not seeing a decrease in the extreme snow seasons and the extreme snow events, even as we are seeing a decrease in the average snowfall. Uh, and so that's interesting because it suggests that there are some competing influences. One, of course, as it gets warmer, uh, you're farther and farther away from the freezing point in some places, and so it's harder and harder to snow on average. But if you do get a pattern where the air mass is cold enough, you may well now get significantly more moisture associated with it. So the snow potential conditioned on a cold atmosphere, even if it's less likely to occur in the first place, is higher. So at high elevations and during extreme snow events, perhaps we are seeing uh, snow events that are at least as extreme as we saw historically, and perhaps even slightly more so. But the average snowpack is still likely to decrease in a warming climate, despite the fact we're going to continue to get these big disruptive banner snow years in between. So there are some interesting questions about climate change that we'll hash out more uh, as we have some time to move beyond the short-term emergencies that are resulting from this really active period. All right here. Uh, is the rain snow we're seeing this winter uh, comparable to 2017 and can we see the impact? Um, of climate change on these storms. I, I addressed the climate change impact already. Uh, this is comparable in nor parts of Northern California to 2016, 2017. In different areas though, so the areas that were hardest hit in 16, 17 are not the areas that have been hardest hit this year, but this is of a similarly anomalous magnitude if we go a little bit farther south. So we're sort of talking the, like the I-80 corridor south into portions of, of Central California. This has been a more significant this has been like that kind of water year for that part of the state. Um, so, so we are, and, and the snowpack uh, is, of course, in the Southern Sierra is greater than in uh, 16, 17. In fact, it's greater than any other year at this point. In the Northern Sierra, it's not at record levels, although it is still well above average. I don't think it's quite as high as 16, 17 up north, but it's above 16, 17 in the south. So it really depends where we're talking about. But I think overall, 
this is kind of a comparable type of winter. And I, you know, and again, I would emphasize that we've seen two historically severe droughts in the past decade, and now we look as appear as we've seen two historically wet winters in Northern California in the same decade. Um, I'll leave it at that. All right, uh, let's see. Keep going down here. Uh, yeah, this is wanting to skip down. So uh, here we go. Uh, Aaron asks, uh, how do we need to change the language around atmospheric river scales and flood danger as as climate change escalates these storms? Um, every storm headline implies catastrophe. Yeah, I really. This is a difficult question, I think. And I talked a little bit about the, the, the science and the practice of communicating hazards to broad audiences in the last, uh, in the last office hour session, as well as in the last blog post. But I will say this, uh, you know, I know that some of the events uh, that have occurred this year have affected certain regions and certainly individuals quite severely. But what we've seen this year is still really nowhere near what we're talking about when we talk about plausible worst case flood scenarios for California. I mean, just it really just does not come close. These things can both be true. You know, events can both be disruptive and bad for individuals and for regions in the short term, and yet still not be as extreme as the kinds of events that we are really, really concerned about uh, at broad scales in the state of California. Uh, or this is, and this is really true anywhere, of course. And so this is really just a long way of saying, saying your mileage may vary depending on where you are, of course. But I do think it's important to reserve the really high-end kind of language, talking about extreme flooding or catastrophic flooding for events that truly are uh, that, uh, truly are catastrophic, meaning that uh, there is widespread uh, threat to through life and perhaps widespread loss of life or widespread damage to or severe damage to property. That is a potential. I mean, that is the kind of scenario that can unfold. And we haven't come very close to that this year. And, it, and I hope we don't. And I don't currently think we will. Uh, but that is something that is important context, I think, in having these conversations. And, you know, we all know that headlines these days, unfortunately, are uh, often not written by the journalists uh, who wrote the article, uh, and often the headlines say something completely different than the content of the article, which I personally find endlessly frustrating, uh, because sometimes uh, otherwise, you know, good information gets obscured by the clickbait headline, right? So sometimes you do have to read past the headline. Uh, I think all journalists would ad strongly advocate for that anyway. Uh, but I also think that it is true that there is some level of catastrophizing that occurs. And the reason I think why that's, you know, there's, there's several reasons why that's problematic. Um, it's, it's not very trauma informed communication for, uh, on the, uh, first of all, but also it really, it really means that when the big one or the, one of the big ones does come along in the future, that folks aren't really going to believe the warnings and the predictions because the other 10 times when it was catastrophic, it really wasn't. And the perception there is that scientists have no idea, you know, how bad an event is really going to be. You just kind of have to make a guess for yourself. But that's not the case. And in general, you don't see the National Weather Service offices in Northern California saying they expect to see catastrophic flooding, you know, on any, on any kind of substantial or widespread basis from these events. And there's a reason for that. Um, they would say that if that were the forecast. Uh, and they do say that in cases, there's in any number of instances around the country where that language has been used uh, in the past decade to describe things that really end up being quite, quite serious and end up costing a lot of lives and causing tremendous property damage. So I think, again, um, keeping things in perspective is important. And there is a lot of, as I've reflected uh, repeatedly, there's a lot of room between uh, no big deal and the end of the world. Um, you know, events can be, uh, can have quite adverse impacts for individuals and communities uh, in the space in between there. And we've certainly gotten to that point this winter, and the upcoming event may get there again, as well as the flood event, the potential snowmelt flood event this spring. But I, I do think it's really, I mean, I, 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 I do think that the language matters here and that the context matters here, and that if everything is the worst thing ever, then nothing is. And that's a problem from a hazard communication perspective and from a, just a, a living one's life um, 
in a circumspect way regarding uh, the absolute magnitude of the risks that always surround us, uh, it becomes difficult to do so if everyone is constantly yelling that the worst thing in the world is happening right now, um, irrespective of the real magnitude of things. Um, all right here. Um, I've got about eight more minutes in this, so I'm scrolling down just to take a look at the comments that have been coming in. Definitely need that caffeine this week. All right. Um, uh, does California, and this is a question that I get all the time, and I see it popping up, so I'd like to address it again, because I think it's a good one. Um, and I, I think it's a genuine question, um, and I think that the answer is not obvious. So Don asks whether California needs to build more dams to control flows if the future weather brings larger moisture uh, or, or brings more moisture uh, rich storms. And on a certain level, I think I understand why a lot of folks um, bring this up uh, as, a, as an idea. And I think it's, 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 I, I think it comes from this place of wanting to uh, have interventions for water systems and flood control and water supply that are commensurate with the changes in climate that we're going to see. So I think that that motivation is actually right on target. But I think here the proposed solution is a bit off target, and I'll explain why. Uh, and this is, you know, th this this is a little bit of of um, uh, of an opinion on my part, but it's a it's an opinion that's formed on the basis of a lot of evidence and having spoken and having really constantly interacted with folks on, on both sides of the spectrum. So folks from the Army Corps of Engineers who are very, let's build dams and levy heavy side of things. Um, you know, I work extensively with folks from the Nature Conservancy of California who really emphasize nature-based solutions. So things like expanding floodplains, groundwater recharge, uh, ecosystem restoration. Uh, and then folks, uh, you know, at, at various state agencies like the Department of Water Resources, um, folks who work on the, 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 the Bay Delta. And really here, it, there, there's a view that we really need some of both of these kinds of solutions, but perhaps there's a reason to emphasize the nature-based solutions rather than the big infrastructure projects. And the reason for this is mainly, well, there's two primary reasons for this. One is that we've already built dams on almost all of the large dammable rivers in California. There aren't really any other rivers for the most part. There's only a handful of rivers that don't have significant dams on them in California. And dams, uh, you know, they, they do have their purpose uh, and their purpose is a, a lot, in a lot of cases twofold, which is one, to store water, capture water in watersheds, retain it for use by humans downstream at later time. And a lot of them also offer flood control. So obviously, if you have a largely empty reservoir and there's a big flood pulse that goes into the reservoir, well, you can decide how gradually you want to release the water downstream up to a certain point. Uh, and you can let that reservoir fill up and buffer those downstream flows to help control flood risk. But there's two big problems with this, especially in a warming climate. One is that dams are, are very ecologically problematic because they, they mean that they interrupt the natural flow of riverine systems all the way from the point of the dam down to the terminus of the, the watershed, which is in this case, it's in California, is often the Bay Delta, so essentially the Pacific Ocean for all intents and purposes. Uh, and uh, the other issue with them is that they're, they, they're, they're helpful up to a point during floods. But after a certain point, of course, once a dam is full, it no longer offers any flood protection at all because you have to start letting all of the water comes out as it comes in. So in a best case scenario, once your dam fills up, if everything goes to plan, the best case scenario is the flow in equals the flow out uh, to maintain safety because you never want the water to flow over the top of a dam that hasn't been designed to do that. That's quite dangerous and can result in much more catastrophic flooding if it happens. So uh, you know, if you have a dam, if you're a dam operator, and the dam isn't specifically designed to have water go over the top of the dam, then you really don't want it to. And so you've got to use these spillways 
these auxiliary structures to release water as quickly as it's coming in to prevent water from spilling over the top. This was, of course, why there was such a crisis at Oroville Dam back in 2017, because the spillway uh, was unusable and the emergency spillway was was uh, didn't function uh, as we had hoped it might, for example. And so the problem in that case was that water effectively was coming over the edge of the dam in the location of the emergency spillway, and that threatened a catastrophic failure of the top 20 feet of that section, for example. That's why that's such a problem. Point being, if we have large dams, they function for flood control really well up to a certain point, and then they don't really help us and potentially become a liability during a really big flood event. Because if for some reason you can't flush water out of that system fast enough, if in is greater than out, essentially, then that bathtub keeps filling up to dangerous levels. And although dam managers and engineers do everything in their power to prevent that from happening, and there are dam retrofit projects going on all around the western US right now to put in more resilient infrastructure to make that even less likely, the chance is not zero, as we saw at Oroville Dam, that something doesn't function as you expect, and you can get a situation where the dam simply isn't able to release water fast enough to prevent bigger problems. And so in that sense, with progressively wetter, larger storms, uh, you potentially have greater risk from large dam systems in terms of downstream flooding. We may be less and less able to buffer downstream flooding in a warming climate with large dam structures. On the other hand, the other kinds of nature-based interventions that are often talked about, including uh, levee setbacks, river bypasses, floodplain restoration, groundwater recharge, um, this includes things like flood mar, so flood-managed aquifer recharge using episodic opportunistic floodwaters to recharge groundwater where and when it's available, uh, and then things like forecast-informed reservoir operations, which are happening right now in California where we have really good weather forecasts in the short term. There, you know, we, that's communicated by uh, a particular group of meteorologists in the state to dam operators, and they... Uh, either maintain more dam safety by releasing water earlier than they would have otherwise without these operations, or they maintain water supply integrity by not releasing as much water if there aren't big storms on the horizon. That's another good intervention, another smart use of data without necessarily building big new infrastructure. So I think in the future, the future of California probably does not involve more big dams, Potentially some surface water storage structures, but probably not huge dams compared to what we already have, and they probably would be off stream, so probably not on rivers, but in other strategic locations. And I think the, you know, equally or more promising are a lot of these nature-based interventions, including the, 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 the floodplain restoration, levee setbacks, having larger flood bypasses on these rivers, we would need to build that. That's still a, you know, a physical infrastructure project, but it's a different kind of infrastructure project. Uh, than building new big dams. Hopefully cheaper, more tractable, and less environmentally problematic, uh, actually. Uh, but they are infrastructure projects nonetheless, but they're often different than the ones that folks jump to. But in general, yes, I think we need to be retooling our water and flood management infrastructure for our uh, 21st century climate that we're getting a pretty substantial taste of right now. I don't think we'll see these huge, enormous, low elevation snowpacks very often like we did this year. That part, I think, is more of an anomaly than a trend. But uh, the really wet winters and the escalating flood risk uh, is something that we are going to have to deal with interspersed with more severe drought. So I do think that there, there there's a good inclination there that we, we do need to be thinking differently about both the water infrastructure that we currently have and we're going to have for decades. You know, we're not getting rid of what we currently have uh, for a very long time, but also thinking how we operate it differently and what auxiliary uh, systems and nature-based interventions we need to be thinking about more seriously and at larger scales to really uh, to, to address this problem in a way that's commensurate with the, the challenge at hand. Just uh, since we're a little bit over time, I'm just going to quickly go through. Um, I'm going to quickly go through and see if there's any remaining questions towards the end. As always, I'm not going to uh, be able to answer everything, but let me just see what's here. Uh, oh yeah, question from Jack Lee. Um, sorry if I missed this, but how much worse could the impacts with this Monday Tuesday storm versus the one last week be? Will the same places be impacted? I did talk about a lot about that at the beginning, so. Uh, if you'd like to rewind, as soon as this is over, you, you can, I think, replay it from the beginning. But uh, just to quickly summarize, since it's probably a good idea for the latecomers anyway, uh, 
this storm won't necessarily be more extreme atmospheric river than the Friday event, but I actually do think it's likely to have more significant wind and flood impacts for two key reasons. One is that the antecedent conditions are now completely saturated, so uh, the watersheds are primed to respond very rapidly to additional rainfall. So even if the rainfall itself isn't that extreme in cumulative terms, it's going to take a lot less, so the, the threshold for causing problems is dramatically lower, So and there will be significant precipitation, widespread moderate to heavy rain with this event. And then number two, uh, this event's coming, going to be associated with a much stronger surface flow, especially if the European model is correct. So unlike the last event, which was kind of diffu a diffuse plume of, of atmospheric river moisture, which nonetheless caused heavy precipitation and flood problems, uh, if this low pressure system really spins up uh, off the coast of the Bay Area, as the European model especially suggests, then the winds are going to be a lot stronger with this event and the, and the, and the dynamics, the storm dynamics, are going to be a lot more impressive. So there's going to be more uh, uh, mesoscale and synoptic scale meteorological forcing. Uh, there's going to be more upward motion in the atmosphere. It's potential for more intense rainfall rates, some thunderstorms, some higher winds. All in all, the potential for a storm that feels more traditionally stormy than just the solid rainfall during the last event. So uh, this may actually be in some ways a more dramatic storm in terms of rain and wind intensities, even if the overall rainfall isn't necessarily any higher or perhaps even is lower with this one, it may fall more quickly on watersheds that are already uh, more saturated and the winds will be stronger. So there will likely be much more widespread wind damage in Northern California and power outages, trees down, especially because the soils are now completely saturated. And a lot of these places have been hit hard already by the December, January storms. So we're talking about places from about Mendocino southward into Monterey County uh, and then eastward from those places. Um, you know, these are all places that have already seen major, you know, flood issues and a lot of wind damage. And so the effects will be somewhat cumulative. Um, I would expect to see lots of, of, of mudslides, uh, shallow sliding going on. Um, so, you know, lots of mountain roads closed either because of trees down or mudslides along with flooding. So in general, even though the precipitation totals may not look that dramatic, some places might not see more than, at lower elevations, much more than an inch or two. And the, mount, and the coastal hills probably more like, you know, three, four, five inches, which is actually not that much in historical terms for these places. But the impacts from this event will probably be outsized relative to the moderate to strong uh, uh, strength atmospheric river would otherwise suggest because of A, the saturated antecedent soil conditions, and B, the proximity of a much deeper surface low associated with this atmospheric river, which has the potential to both intensify the rain bands and the wind storm, uh, and also to maybe, if we're unlucky, stall out the atmospheric river somewhere longer than expected. This is the kind of situation when mesoscale frontal waves can develop that aren't well resolved in models even a day in advance. So. Um, the uh, I do think uh, that the that the risks in many places uh, could be higher with this event, especially in Northern California. Uh, there could be significant flooding in Southern California if the American model is more correct and this is a little bit more diffuse and further south. But overall, I think um, this is going to be another uh, high to very high impact storm, perhaps even higher impact than the initial storm, even though. I still don't think that the main stem rivers are likely to reach major flood stage during this event. Uh, there could be much more significant flash flooding and flooding of smaller rivers during this event in places that did not see it during the last one. So I think with that, uh, I'm probably going to have to run. Um, I'll still be on uh, Twitter, of course. There's a new blog post out today from yes late yesterday that I think is still relevant, so feel free to Take a look at that, and I may do one more uh, office hour event later this week in the wake of the storm to discuss what happened and hopefully to uh, reassure folks that there isn't another big storm on the horizon, which is what currently appears to be the case, that things calm down after Tuesday or Wednesday this week, but I can reevaluate that on Tuesday or Wednesday and see how things are actually going. So until then, uh, thanks for watching and 